Chapter 8 I woke up. That in itself is worthy of note, I think, given the circumstances. I was in the hollow's burrow, and piled around me were the bodies of many hollowgast. They might have been dead, but it was likelier they breathed what remained of Mother Dust's pinky finger, and the result was tangled in a spaghetti of stinking, snoring, mostly unconscious, hollow flesh. I gave a silent prayer of thanks for Mother Dust, and then wondered, with rising alarm, how long I'd been down here. An hour? A day? What had happened to everyone above? I had to go. A few of the hollows were beginning to stir from sleep, like me, but they were still woozy. With great effort, I stood. Apparently my wounds were not so grave, my bones not so broken. I swayed, dizzy, then caught my balance and began to move through the enmeshed hollows. I kicked one in the head by accident. With a grunt, it came awake and opened its eyes. I froze, thinking that if I ran, it would only chase me down. It seemed to register me, but as neither a threat nor a potential meal, then closed its eyes again. I continued on, placing each foot with care until I had passed the carpet of hollows and reached a wall. Here, the tunnel ended. The way out was above me, a chute leading upward a hundred feet or so to an open grate and that cluttered room. There were holes along the chute, but they were spaced too far apart, built for hollows, acrobatic tongues, not human hands and feet. I stood peering up at a ring of dim light far overhead, hoping a friendly face might appear there, but I dared not shout for help. In desperation, I jumped, scrabbling at the hard wall and grasping for the first hold. Somehow, I reached it, pulled myself up, Suddenly, I was more than ten feet off the ground. How had I done that? I jumped again and reached the next hold, and the next one. I was climbing the chute, my legs launching me higher, and my arms reaching further than I knew was possible. This is insane! And then I was at the top, poking my head out, pushing myself up into the room. I wasn't even breathing hard. I looked around, saw Emma's firelight, and ran toward it across the cluttered floor. I tried calling out, but couldn't seem to make the words. No matter, there she was, on the other side of the open glass door in the office. Warren was on this side, tied to the chair Miss Glassbill had sat in, and when I came close, he groaned fearfully and knocked himself over. Then their faces were at the door, suspicious and peering. Emma and Miss Peregrine and Horace, and behind them other Imbrins and friends too, all there, alive, beautiful. They had been freed from their cells only to be imprisoned once more in here, locked behind Call's bomb-proof bunker door, safe from whites, for now, but trapped. Their expressions were fearful, and the closer I got to the glass door, the more terrified they became. It's me, I tried to say, but the words didn't come out right, and my friends jumped back. It's me, it's Jacob. What came out instead of English was a husky snarl and three long, fat tongues waving in the air before me spat from my own mouth in my attempt to speak. And then I heard one of my friends, Enoch, it was Enoch, say aloud the terrible thing that had just occurred to me. It's a hollow. I'm not, I tried to say. I'm not. But all evidence was to the contrary. I had somehow become one of them, been bitten and turned. Like a vampire, 
or been killed, eaten, recycled, reincarnated. Oh God, oh God, it can't be. I tried to reach out with my hands to make some sign that might be recognized as human now that my mouth had failed me, but it was my tongues that reached out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to drive this thing. Emma swiped blindly at me with her hand and connected. Sudden, searing pain flashed through me. And then I woke up. Again. Or, rather, jolted by a sudden pain, I woke back into my body. My hurt, human body, still lying in the dark in the slack jaws of a sleeping hollow. And yet... I was still the hollow above, too, snatching my hurt tongue back into my mouth and stumbling away from the door. I was somehow dually present in both my mind and the hollows, and I found now that I could control both, could lift my own arm and the hollows, turn my own head and the hollows, and do it all without saying a word aloud, but merely by thinking. Without realizing it, without consciously trying, I had mastered the hollow to such a degree, seeing through its eyes, feeling through its skin, that it had felt, for a time, like I was the hollow. But now a distinction was becoming clear. I was this fallible and broken-bodied boy, deep in a hole surrounded by groggy monsters. They were waking, all but the one who had brought me down here in its jaws. It had so much dust in its system that it might sleep for years. And they were sitting up now, shaking the numbness from their limbs but they didn't seem interested in killing me. They were watching me, quiet and attentive, semicircled around like well-behaved children at story time, waiting for input. I rolled myself out of the hollow's jaws and onto the floor. I could sit up, but was too hurt to stand. But they could stand. Stand! I didn't say it. I didn't even think it, really. It felt like doing. Only it wasn't me who did it. They did it. Eleven hollowgast all rising to their feet before me in perfect synchrony. This was astounding, of course, and yet I felt a profound sense of calm spreading through me. I was relaxing into the purest depths of my ability. Something about shutting down all our minds at once, then bringing them online together, a collective reboot, had brought us into a kind of harmony, allowing me to tap into the unconscious heart of my power, as well as into the hollow's minds at just the moment their defenses were down. And now they were mine. Marionettes I could control with invisible strings. But how much could I do? What were the limits? How many could I control at once, discreetly? To find out, I began to play. In the room above, I lay the hollow down. He lay down. They were all he's, I had decided. I made the ones in front of me jump. They jumped. They were two distinct groups now, the loner above and the ones before me. I tried controlling each individually, making one raise a hand without the rest doing it. It was a bit like asking one toe on your foot to wiggle. Difficult, not impossible, but before long I'd gotten the hang of it. The less conscious I was of trying, the easier it became. The control came most naturally when I simply imagined an action being performed. I sent them away into the bone piles farther down the tunnel, 
then had them pick up bones with their tongues and toss them to one another, first one at a time, then two, then three and four, piling action upon action until I'd gotten up to six. It was only when I made the hollow upstairs stand and do jumping jacks that the bone tossers began to miss catches. I don't think it would be bragging to say I was very good at this, unnatural even. I could tell that with more time to practice, I had the capacity to become masterful. I could have played both sides of an all hollow basketball game. I could have made them dance every roll in Swan Lake. But there was no more time to practice. This would have to do. And so I gathered them around me, had the strongest one pick me up and saddle me to its back with a wrapped around tongue, and one by one my monstrous little army bounded up the chute and into the room above. The overhead lights had been turned on in the cluttered room, and in their harsh glow I could see that the only bodies remaining were mannequins and models. The imprints had all been taken out. The glass door to Cole's observation room was closed. I made the hollows hang back while I approached it alone, saved the hollow I was riding, then called out to my friends, this time with my own voice in English. It's me, it's Jacob. They rushed to the door, Emma's face circled by the others. Jacob! Her voice was muffled behind the glass. You're alive! But as she studied me, her face turned strange, as if she couldn't understand what she was seeing. Because I was on the hollow's back, I realized, it looked to Emma like I was floating above the ground. It's all right, I said. I'm riding a holocaust. I slapped its shoulder to prove there was something solid and fleshy beneath me. He's completely under my control. And so are these. I brought the eleven hollows forward, stamping their feet to announce themselves. My friend's mouths went oval-shaped with wonder. Is that really you, Jacob? Olive asked. What do you mean you're controlling them? Enoch said. You've got blood on your shirt, said Bronwyn. They opened the glass door just wide enough to talk through. I explained how I fell into the hollow's pit, was nearly bitten in half, was numbed and put to sleep, and woke up with a dozen of them under my control. As further demonstration, I had the hollows pick up Warren, the chair he was tied to and all, and toss him back and forth a few times, the chair flipping end over end until the kids were cheering and Warren was groaning as if he was going to be sick. Finally, I had them set him down. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I'd never have believed it, Enoch said. Not in a million years. You're fantastic, I heard a little voice say, and there was Claire. Let me get a look at you, I said, but when I approached the open door, she shrank away. Impressed with my skills, though they were, overcoming a peculiar's natural fear of hollow gas is no easy thing, and the smell probably didn't help either. It's safe, I said. I promise. Olive came right to the door. I'm not scared. Me neither, said Emma, and me first. She stepped through the door and came to meet me. I made the hollow kneel, leaned away from it, and managed, somewhat awkwardly, to put my arms around Emma. Sorry, I can't quite stand up on my own, I said, my face against her cheek, my closed eyes brushing her soft hair. It wasn't enough, but for now, it would have to be. You're hurt, she pulled away to look me over. You've got cuts everywhere, and they're deep. I can't feel them. I got dust all over me. That could mean you're only numb, not healed. I'll worry about it later. How long was I down there? Hours, she whispered. We thought you were dead. I nudged her forehead with mine. I made you a promise, remember? I need you to make me a new promise. Quit scaring the hell out of me. I'll 
Do my best? No, promise. Once this is over, I'll make any promise you like. I'm going to remember that, she said. Miss Peregrine appeared at the door. You two had better come in here and leave that beast outside, please. Miss P, I said. You're on your feet. Yes, I'm recovering, she replied. I was spared by my late arrival here and by some nepotistic favoritism on my brother's part. Not all my fellow imbrins were so lucky. I wasn't sparing you, sister, said a booming voice from above. Call again through the PA system. I was merely saving the tastiest dish for last. You shut up, Emma shouted. When we find you, Jacob's Hollows will eat you for breakfast. Call laughed. I doubt that, he said. You're more powerful than I imagined, boy. But don't be fooled. You're surrounded with no way out. You've only delayed the inevitable. But if you give up now, I might consider sparing some of you with a quick flick of their tongues, I made the hollows rip the speakers from the ceiling and smash them on the ground. As wires and parts sprang everywhere, Call's voice went dead. When we find him, Enoch said, I'd like to pull out his fingernails before we kill him. Anyone have a problem with that? As long as I can send a squadron of bees up his nose first, said Hugh. That's not our way, Miss Peregrine said. When this is all over, he'll be sentenced by imbrinic law to rot in a punishment loop for the rest of his unnatural life. Where's the fun in that? said Enoch. Miss Peregrine gave him a withering look. I made the hollow let me go and with Emma's help, I limped through the door and into the observation room. My friends were all there, all but Fiona. Ranged along the walls and resting in office chairs, I could see pale, frightened faces watching me. The imbrins. But before I could go to them, my friends blocked my way. They threw their arms around me, holding up my tottering body with their embraces. I gave in to it. I hadn't felt anything so sweet in a long time. Then Addison came trotting up as nobly as he could with two hurt paws, and I broke away to greet him. That's twice now you've saved me, I said, putting a hand on his furry head. I don't know how I'll ever repay you. You can start by getting us out of this bloody loop, he growled. I'm sorry I ever crossed that bridge. Those who heard him laughed. Maybe it was his canine nature, but Addison had no filter. He always said just what he meant. That stunt you pulled with the truck was one of the bravest things I ever saw, I said. I was captured the minute I got inside the compound. I'm afraid I let you all down. There was a sudden loud boom from outside the heavy door. The room shook. Small items tumbled off shelves. The whites are trying to blow in the door, Miss Peregrine explained. They've been at it for some time. We'll deal with them, I said. But first, I want to know who's unaccounted for. Things will get out of hand when we open that door. So if there are peculiars elsewhere in this compound who need rescuing, I want to keep them in mind as we go into battle. It was so dark and crowded that we resorted to a roll call. I called our friends' names twice just to make doubly sure they were all here. Then I asked after the peculiars who'd been snatched from Miss Wren's ice house alongside us. The clown thrown into the chasm, Olive told us through hitching sobs for refusing orders from the whites. The folding man left on the underground in grave condition. 
telekinetic Melina, upstairs and unconscious, having had some of her soul drained, and the Pale Brothers, same. Then there were the kids Miss Wren had rescued, the plain-looking boy in the floppy hat and the frizzy-haired snake charmer girl. Bronwyn said she'd seen them being let off to another part of the compound, where other peculiars were being held. Lastly, we counted the Imbrins. There was Miss Peregrine, of course, whose side the kids had not left since they were reunited. There was so much I wanted to talk with her about. All that had happened to us since we last saw her. All that had happened to her. Though there was no time to say any of it, something did pass between us in the brief moments our eyes would meet in passing. She regarded Emma and me with a certain pride and wonder. I trust you, her eyes said. But Miss Peregrine, as deeply glad as we were to see her, wasn't the only Imbrin we had to be concerned about. There were twelve in all. She introduced her friends. Miss Wren, whom Emma had cut down from the ceiling, was wounded but coherent. Miss Glassbill was still staring in her vague and mindless way. The eldest, Miss Avocet, who hadn't been seen since she and Miss Peregrine were kidnapped together on Cairnholm, occupied a chair near the door. Miss Bunting, Miss Tree Creeper, and several others fussed over her, adjusting blankets around her shoulders. Nearly all of them looked frightened, which seemed distinctly un imbrin like They were supposed to be our elders and our leaders, but they'd been in captivity here for weeks, and they had seen things and had things done to them that had left them shell-shocked. They also didn't share my friend's confidence in my ability to control a dozen hollowgast and were keeping as far away from my creatures as the dimensions of the room would allow. At the end of it, there was still one person among us who hadn't been named, a bearded, small-statured man who stood silently by the Imbrins, watching us through dark glasses. And? Who's this? I said. A white? The man became incensed. No! He tore off the glasses to show us his eyes, which were severely crossed. I am him! He said, his accent thick and Italian. There was a large leather-bound book on a table next to him, and he pointed to it, as if this somehow explained his identity. I felt a hand on my arm. It was Millard, invisible now, his suit of stripes removed. Allow me to introduce history's foremost temporal cartographer, he said grandly. Jacob... This is Perplexus Anomalous. Bonjour now, said Perplexus. How do you do? It's an honor to meet you, I said. Yes, he said, nose rising in the air. It is. What's he doing here? I whispered to Millard. And how is he still alive? Cole found him living in some... 14th century loop in Venice that no one knew existed. He's been here two days, though, which means he could age forward very soon. As I had come to understand such things, Perplexus was in danger of aging forward because the loop he'd been living in was considerably older than the one we were in now, and the difference between those times would eventually catch up with him. I'm your biggest fan, Millard said to Perplexus. I have all your maps. Yes, you tell me already, Perplexus said. Grazie. None of that explains what he's doing here, said Emma. Perplexus wrote about finding the Library of Souls in his journals, said Millard. So Cole tracked him down, kidnapped him, and made him tell where it was. I made all the blood to never say nothing, Perplexus said miserably. 
Now I'm cursed forever. I want to get Perplexus back to his loop before he ages, said Millard. I won't be responsible for the loss of Peculiatum's greatest living treasure. From outside the door came another boom, this one even bigger and louder than before. The room trembled and pebbly bits of rock rained from the ceiling. We'll do our best, dear, Miss Peregrine said, but we've got other things to see about first. We quickly hatched a plan of action, such as it was, throw open the big door and use my hollows to clear the way. They were expendable, seemed a good working order, and my connection with them was only growing stronger. As for what could go wrong, I dared not even wonder. We would find call if we could, but our priority was escaping the compound alive. I brought my hollows into the little room. Everyone gave them a wide berth, pressing their backs to the walls and their hands over their noses as the creatures shuffled past and gathered round the heavy door. The largest hollow knelt down and I saddled myself to him once more, which made me so tall I had to hunch forward to keep my head from scraping the ceiling. We could hear the voices of whites outside in the corridor. No doubt they were planting another bomb. We decided to wait until they set it off before going out. So we stood by, waiting, a taut silence filling the room. Finally, Bronwyn broke the tension. I think Mr. Jacob should say something to all of us. Like what? I said, making my hollow turn so I was facing everyone. Well, you're about to lead us into battle, said Bronwyn. Something leaderly. Something inspiring, said Hugh. Something that'll make us less terrified, said Horace. That's a lot of pressure. I said, feeling a bit self-conscious. I don't know if this will make anyone less terrified, but it's something I've been thinking about. I've only known you for a few weeks, but it feels like so much longer than that. You're the best friends I've ever had. And it's weird to think that just a couple of months ago, I was back at home, and I didn't even know you were real, and I still have my grandfather. There were noises outside in the hall, muffled voices, the thud of something metal being dropped on the ground. I continued louder. I miss my grandfather every day, but a very smart friend once told me that everything happens for a reason. If I hadn't lost him, well, I never would have found you. So I guess I had to lose one part of my family to find another. Anyway, that's how you make me feel. Like family. Like one of you. You are one of us, Emma said. You're our family. We love you, Jacob, said Olive. It's been quite something knowing you, Mr. Portman, Miss Peregrine said. You would have made your grandfather... Very proud. Thanks, I said, getting emotional and a bit embarrassed. Jacob, said Horace, may I give you something? Of course, I said. The other, sensing that something private was unfolding between us, began to murmur amongst themselves. Horace came as close to the hollow as he could bear and, trembling slightly, held out a folded square of cloth. I took it, reaching down from my high place on the hollow's back. It's a scarf, said Horace. Miss P was able to smuggle me a pair of needles and I knitted it while I was in my cell. I reckon that making it kept me from going mad in there. I thanked him and unfolded it. The scarf was simple and gray with knotted tassels on the ends, but it was well made and even had my initials monogrammed in one corner. J.P. 
Wow, Horace, it's... it's no great work of art. If I'd had my book of patterns, I could have done better. It's amazing, I said. But how did you know you'd even see me again? I had a dream, he said, smiling coyly. Will you wear it? I know it isn't cold, but for luck. Of course, I said, and wrapped it clumsily around my neck. No, that'll never stay on, like this. He showed me how to fold it in half lengthwise, then loop it around my neck and back through itself so that it knotted perfectly at my throat and the loose ends hung neatly down my shirt. Not exactly battle wear, but I didn't see the harm. Emma sidled up to us. Did you dream about anything besides men's fashion? She said to Horace. Like, where Call might be hiding? Horace shook his head and started to answer. No, but I did have a fascinating dream about postage stamps. But before he could tell us more, there was a noise from the corridor, like a dump truck crashing into a wall, a sonic thud that shook us to the marrow. The big bunker door in the end of the room blew open, flinging hinges and bits of shrapnel into the opposite walls. Thankfully, everyone had been standing clear of it. There followed a blank moment while the smoke cleared and everyone slowly uncrouched themselves. Then, through the ringing of my ears, I heard an amplified voice say, Send the boy out alone and no one gets hurt. Somehow, I don't believe them, said Emma. Definitely not, said Horace. Don't even think about it, Mr. Portman, said Miss Peregrine. I wasn't, I replied. Is everyone ready? Murmurs of assent. I moved the hollows to either side of the door, their great jaws hinging open, tongues at the ready. I was about to launch my surprise attack when I heard Call's voice through a PA in the hallway. They have control of the hollows. Fall back, men. Defensive positions. Damn him, Emma cried. The sound of her treating boots filled the corridor. Our surprise attack had been spoiled. It doesn't matter, I said. When you've got twelve hollows, you don't need surprise. It was time to use my secret weapon. Rather than a welling up of tension before the strike, I felt the opposite. A loosening of my full and present self as my awareness relaxed and split among the hollows. And then... While my friends and I hung back, the creatures began hurling themselves through the jagged, blasted door into the hall, running, snarling, jaws gaping, their invisible bodies carving tunnels in the curling bomb smoke. The whites fired at them, their gun barrels flashing, then fell back. Bullets whizzed through the open doorway and into the room where I and the others were taking cover cracking into the wall behind us. Tell us when, Emma shouted. We go at your word. My mind in a dozen places at once, I could muster hardly a word of English in reply. I was them, those hollows in the hall, my own flesh stinging in sympathy with every shot that tore theirs. Our tongues reached them first the whites who had not run fast enough, and the brave but foolish ones who'd lingered to fight. We pummeled them, smacked their heads into the walls, and a small number of us stopped, too. Here I tried to disconnect my own senses, to sink our teeth into them, swallowing their guns, silencing their screams, leaving them gashed and gaping. Bottlenecked at the stairs at the end of the corridor, the guards fired again. A second curtain of bullets passed through us, deep and painful, but we ran on, tongues flailing. Some of the whites escaped through the hatch. Others weren't so lucky, and when they'd stopped screaming, we tossed their bodies clear of the stairs. I felt two of my hollows die their signals blanking from my mind, the connection lost. And then the corridor was clear. 
No, I said to Emma, which at that moment was the most complex speech I could manage. Now, Emma shouted, turning to the rest of the group. This way. I drove my hollow into the corridor, clutching at its neck to keep from being thrown off its back. Emma fell in behind me with the others, using her flaming hands as signals in the smoke. Together we charged down the hall, my battalion of monsters before me, my army of peculiars behind. First among them were the strongest and the bravest, Emma, Bronwyn, and Hugh. Then the Imbrins and grumbling Perplexus, who insisted on bringing his heavy map of days. Last came the youngest children, the timid, the injured. The corridor smelled of gunpowder and blood. Don't look, I heard Bronwyn say as we began to pass the bodies of dead whites. I counted them as we ran. There were five, six, seven of them to my two fallen hollows. Those were encouraging numbers, but how many whites were there in total? Forty? Fifty? I worried that there were too many of them to kill and too many of us to protect, and that above ground we'd be easily overwhelmed, surrounded, and confused. I had to kill as many whites as I could before they broke into the open, and this fight turned into something we couldn't win. My awareness slid to the hollows again, bounding up the spiral steps. The first one was up through the hatch, then searing pain, blankness. It had been ambushed as it came out. I made the next one out of the hatch pick up the dead one's body to use as a shield. It soaked up a volley of gunfire, pushing forward into the room as other hollows leapt from the hatch behind it. I had to push the whites out fast to get them away from the peculiars who lay everywhere in hospital beds. With a few lashes of our tongues, the closest ones were struck down, and the rest ran. I sent my hollows after them as we peculiars emerged from the hatch. There were so many of us now, so many hands, that unhooking our bedridden brethren from their soul drains would be easy. We spread out and made quick work of it. As for the chained madman and the boy we'd stashed in a closet, they were safer here than with us. We'd be back. Meanwhile, my remaining hollows chased the whites toward the building's exit. The whites fired wildly behind them as they fled. Snatching at their heels with our tongues, we were able to trip two or three who met a quick but gruesome end once my hollows caught up with them. One white had hidden himself behind a counter where he was arming a bomb. A hollow rooted him out, then bundled both the white and his bomb into a side room. The bomb went off moments later. Another hollow winked out of my consciousness. The whites had scattered and more than half had escaped, diving through windows and outside doors. We were losing them. The fight was shifting. We'd finished unhooking the bedridden peculiars and had nearly caught up to my hollows, which now numbered seven, plus the one I was riding. We were near the exit, in the room of horrible tools, and we had a choice. I posed the question to those closest to me. Emma, Miss Peregrine, Enoch, Bronwyn. Do we use the hollows as cover and run for the tower? I said, my language coming back as the hollows I had to keep track of dwindled. Or do we keep fighting? Surprisingly, they all agreed. We can't stop now, Enoch said, wiping blood from his hands. If we do, they'll just keep chasing us forever, Bronwyn said. No, we won't said an injured white who was cowering on the floor nearby. We'll sign a peace treaty. We tried that in 1945, said Miss Peregrine. It wasn't worth the lavatory paper it was written on. We must keep fighting, children. We may not have 
such an opportunity again. Emma raised a flaming hand. Let's burn this place to the ground. I sent my hollows racing out of the lab building into the courtyard after the remaining whites. The hollows were ambushed again and another was killed, going dark from my mind as it died. Save the one I was writing, by now all my hollows had taken at least a bullet apiece, but Despite their wounds, most were still going strong. Hollows, as I had learned several times the hard way, are tough little buggers. The whites, on the other hand, seemed to be running scared, but that didn't mean I could count them out. Not knowing precisely where they were only made them more dangerous. I tried to keep my friends inside the building while I sent the hollows to do reconnaissance, but the Peculiars were angry and charged up, itching to get into the fight. Out of my way, said Hugh, trying to push past Emma and me who were blocking the door. It ain't fair for Jacob to do everything, Olive said. You've killed nearly half the Whites now, but I hate them just as much as you do. If anything, I've hated them longer, near a hundred years. So come on. It was true. These kids had a century of white hatred to work out of their systems, and I was hogging all the glory. This was their fight, too, and it wasn't my place to keep them from it. If you really want to help, I said to Olive, here's what you can do. Thirty seconds later, we were out in the open courtyard, and Horace and Hugh were reeling Olive up into the air by a rope around her waist. Right away, she became our invaluable eye in the sky, shouting back intel that my ground-bound hollows could never have gathered. There's a couple to the right, past the little white shed, and another on the roof, and some running toward the big wall. They hadn't scattered to the winds, but were mostly out beyond the courtyard. With any luck, they could still be caught. I called my six remaining hollows back to us spread four of them into a phalanx that would march before us and two behind us as a guard against rear attacks. That left my friends and me to sweep the space between and deal with any whites that might breach our wall of hollows. We began marching toward the edge of the courtyard. Astride my personal hollow, I felt like a general commanding his troops from horseback. Emma was at my side, and the other peculiars were just behind. Bronwyn collecting loose bricks to hurl, Horace and Hugh hanging onto Olive's rope, Miller detaching himself to Perplexus, who was unleashing a constant stream of Italian profanities while shielding himself with his map of days. At the back, the Imbrins whistled and made loud bird calls in an attempt to recruit winged friends to our cause. But Devil's Acre was such a dead zone that there were few wild birds to be found. Miss Peregrine had taken charge of old Miss Avocet and the few shell-shocked Imbrins. There was nowhere to leave them. They'd have to accompany us into battle. We came to the edge of the courtyard, beyond which was a run of open ground about 50 meters long. In all that space was just one small building all that stood between us and the outer wall. It was a curious structure with a pagoda roof and tall, ornate doors into which I saw a number of whites flee. According to Olive, nearly all the remaining whites had taken up positions inside the little building. One way or another, we were going to have to flush them out. A quiet had settled over the compound. There were no whites visible anywhere. We lingered behind a protective wall to discuss our next move. What are they doing in there? I said. Trying to lure us out into the open, Emma said. No problem. I'll send the hollows. Won't that leave us unguarded? I don't know that we have a choice. All have counted 20 whites going in there at least. I need to send enough hollows to overwhelm them or they'll just get slaughtered. I took a breath scanned the tense, waiting faces around me. I sent the hollows out one by one, sliding across the open yard on tiptoe, hoping light footsteps might allow them to surround the building unnoticed. 
It seemed to work. The building had three doors, and I managed to place two hollows at each one without a single white showing his face. The hollows stood guard outside the doors while I listened through their ears. Inside, I could hear someone with a high voice speaking, though I couldn't make out the words. Then a bird whistled. My blood went cold. There were imprints inside. More that we hadn't known were here. Hostages. But if that was true, why weren't the whites trying to negotiate? My original plan had been to break down all the doors at once and charge inside. But if there were hostages, especially Imbrin hostages, I couldn't risk such rash action. I decided to have one of the hollows risk a look inside. All the windows were shuttered though, which meant I'd have to send it through a door. I chose the smallest hollow, reeled out its dominant tongue. It licked the knob, gripped it. I'm sending one inside, I said. Just one to look around. Slowly, the hollow turned the knob. On my silent count of three, the hollow pushed open the door. It leaned forward and pressed its black eye to the crack. I'm looking inside. Through its eye, I could see a slice of wall lined with cages, heavy, black bird cages of various shapes and sizes. The hollow pressed the door open farther. I saw more cages, and now birds, too, in the cages and out of them, chained to perches. But no whites. What do you see? Emma said. There wasn't time to explain, only to act. I made all my hollows throw open the doors at once, and they burst inside. There were birds everywhere, startled and squawking. Birds, I said. The room's full of imbrins. What? Emma said. Where are the whites? I don't know. The hollows were turning, smelling the air, searching every nook and cranny. That can't be, Miss Peregrine said. All the kidnapped imbrins are right here. Then what are these birds? I said. Then... In a scratchy parrot voice, I heard one sing. Run, rabbit, run, rabbit, run. And I realized these were not imbrants. These were parrots, and they were ticking. Hit the dirt, I shouted, and we all dove to the ground behind the courtyard wall, the hollow pitching backward and taking me with it. I flung my hollows at the doors, but the parrot bombs went off before they could get through them, ten at once, obliterating the building and the hollows in a terrible clap of thunder. As dirt and brick and bits of building flew through the courtyard and rained down on us, I felt the hollows' signals go dead together, all but one blacking from my mind. A cloud of smoke and feathers blew over the wall. The peculiars and imbrins were streaked with dirt, coughing, checking one another for holes. I was in shock, or something like it. My eyes locked on a splattered patch of ground where a bit of pulped and quivering hollow gas had been flung. For an hour, my mind had been stretching to accommodate twelve of them, and their sudden death had created a disorienting vacuum that left me feeling dizzy and strangely bereft. But crisis has a way of focusing the mind, and what happened next had my last remaining hollow in me sitting bolt upright. From beyond the wall came the sound of many voices shouting together, a great and rising battle cry, and beneath it, a thunder of stampeding boots. Everyone froze and looked at me, dread furrowing their faces. What is that? said Emma. Let me see. 
I said, and crawled away from my hollow to peer around the edge of the wall. A horde of whites was charging toward us across the smoking ground, twenty of them in a cluster, running with rifles and pistols raised, their white eyes and white teeth shining. They were unscathed by the explosion, having escaped, I assumed, into some underground shelter. We'd been lured into a trap, of which the parrot bombs were only the first component. Now that our best weapon had been stripped from us, the whites were making their final assault. There was a panicked scramble as others looked around the wall to see the charging horde for themselves. What do we do? cried Horace. We fight, said Bronwyn. Give him everything we've got. No, we must run while we can, said Miss Avocet, whose bent back and deeply lined face made it hard to imagine her running from anything. We can't afford to lose another peculiar life. Excuse me, but I was asking Jacob, said Horace. He got us this far, after all. Instinctively, I looked to Miss Peregrine, whom I considered the final authority on matters of authority. She returned my gaze and nodded. Yes, she said. I think Mr. Portman should decide. Quickly, though, or the Whites will make the decision for you. I nearly protested. My hollows were all dead but one. But I suppose this was Miss Peregrine's way of saying she believed in me, hollows or no. Anyway, what we should do seemed obvious. In a hundred years, the Peculiars had never been so close to destroying the White Menace, and if we ran away now, I knew that chance may never come again. My friends' faces were scared but determined, ready, I thought, to risk their lives for a chance to finally eradicate the White Scourge. We fight, I said. We've come too far to give up now. If there was someone among us who would rather have fled, they stayed quiet. Even the Embrans, who had sworn oaths to keep us safe, didn't argue. They knew what sort of fate awaited any of us who were recaptured. You give the word, said Emma. I craned my neck around the wall. The whites were closing fast. No more than a hundred feet away now, but I wanted them closer still, close enough that we might easily knock the guns from their hands. Shots rang out. A piercing scream came from above. Olive! Emma shouted. They're shooting at Olive! We'd left the poor girl hanging up there. The whites were taking pot shots at her while she squealed and waved her limbs like a starfish. There was no time to reel her in, but we couldn't just leave her for target practice. Let's give him something better to shoot at, I said. Ready? Their answer was resounding and affirmative. I shimmied onto the back of my crouched hollow. Let's go, I shouted. The hollow leapt to its feet, nearly bucking me off, then launched forward like a racehorse at the starting gun. We burst from behind the wall, the hollow and I leading the charge, my friends and our embrins close behind. I let out a screaming war cry, not so much to scare the whites as to tear down the fear that was clawing at me and my friends did the same. The whites balked and for a moment they couldn't seem to decide whether to keep charging or stop and shoot at us. That bought the hollow in me enough time to clear much of the open ground that separated us. It didn't take long for the whites to make up their minds. They stopped, 
leveled their guns at us like a firing squad and let loose a volley of bullets. They whizzed around me, pocking the ground, lighting up my pain receptors as they slammed into the hollow. Praying it hadn't been hit anywhere vital, I sank low to shield myself behind its body and urged it forward, faster, using its tongues like extra legs to speed us on. The hollow and I closed the remaining gap in just a few seconds, my friends close behind. Then we were among them, fighting hand to hand, and the advantage was ours. While I concentrated on knocking the guns out of the white's hands, my friends put their peculiar talents to good use. Emma swung her hands like flaming clubs, cutting through a line of whites. Bronwyn hurled the bricks she'd gathered, then punched and pummeled the whites with her bare hands. Hugh's lone bee had recently made some friends, and as he cheered them on, Go for the eyes, fellows! They swirled around and dive-bombed our enemy wherever they could. So did the Embrins, who turned themselves into birds after the first gunshots. Miss Peregrine was most fearsome, her huge beak and talons sending whites running. But even small, colorful Miss Bunting made herself useful, ripping one white's hair and pecking his head hard enough to make him miss the shot he was taking which allowed Claire to leap up and bite him on the shoulder with her wide, sharp-toothed back mouth. Enoch did his part too, revealing from under his shirt three clay men with forks for legs and knives for arms, which he sent hacking after the white's ankles. All the while, Olive shouted advice to us from her bird's-eye view. Behind you, Emma. He's going for his gun, Hugh. Despite all our peculiar ingenuity, however, we were outnumbered, and the Whites were fighting as if their lives depended on it, which likely they did. Something hard crashed into my head, the butt of a gun, and I hung limp from the hollow's back for a moment. The world spinning around me. Miss Bunting was caught and thrown to the ground, it was chaos, awful, bloody chaos, and the whites were beginning to take the momentum, forcing us back. And then, from behind me, I heard a familiar roar. My senses were turning. I looked and saw Bentham galloping toward the fight astride the back of his grim bear. Both were soaking wet having come through the Panlupticon the same way Emma and I had. Hello, young man, he called, riding up next to me. In need of some assistance? Before I could reply, my hollow was shot again, the bullet passing through the side of its neck and grazing my thigh, painting a bloody line through my torn pants. Yes, please, I shouted. P.T., you heard the boy, Bentham said. Kill. The bear dove into the fight, swinging his giant paws and knocking whites aside like they were bowling pins. One ran up and shot P.T. point blank in the chest with a small handgun. The bear seemed merely annoyed, then picked up the white and sent him flying. Soon... With my hollow and Bentham's grim working together, we had the whites on the defensive. When we'd picked off enough of them that it became clear they were outnumbered, their ranks whittled to no more than ten. They took off and ran. Don't let them escape, Emma cried. We tore after the whites on foot, on wing, on bareback and hollowback. We chased them through the smoking ruins of the parrot house, across ground stippled with catapulted rodents from Sharon's insurrection, toward an arched gate built into the looming outer wall. Miss Peregrine screamed overhead, dive-bombing fleeing whites. She pulled one off his feet by the back of his neck, 
But this and more attacks from Hugh's bees only made the nine that were left run even faster. Their lead was growing and my hollow was beginning to fail, leaking black fluid from half a dozen wounds. The whites crashed on blindly, the gate's iron portcullis rising as they neared it. Stop them! I shouted, hoping that beyond the gate, Sharon and his unruly crowd might hear. And then I realized, the bridge. There was still another hollow ghast left, the one inside the bridge. If I could get control of him in time, maybe I could stop the whites from escaping. But no, they were already through the gate, running up the bridge, and I was hopelessly behind. By the time I passed through the gate, the bridge hollow had already picked up and tossed five of them across to Smoking Street, where only a thin crowd of Ambro addicts was lingering, not enough to stop them. The four whites who hadn't yet crossed were stuck at the bridge gap, waiting their turn to be flung. As my hollow and I started running up the bridge, I felt the bridge hollow come online inside me. It was picking up three of the four whites and lifting them across. Stop, I said aloud and hollow. Or at least that's what I thought I said, though maybe something got lost in translation and maybe stop sounds a lot like draw in hollow speak, because rather than stopping midair and then bringing me three kicking and terrified whites back to our side of the bridge, the hollow simply let them go. How strange. All the peculiars on our side of the chasm and the attics on the other side came to the edge to watch them fall, howling and flailing all the way down through layers of sulfurous green mist until plop, they plunged into the boiling river and disappeared. A cheer went up on both sides and a grating voice I recognized said, Serves them right. They were lousy tippers anyway. It was one of two bridgeheads that were still on their pikes. Didn't your mum ever tell you not to swim on a full stomach? Said the other. Wait twenty minutes. The lone white remaining on our side threw down his gun and raised his hands in surrender while the five who'd made it across were quickly vanishing into a cloud of ash the wind had kicked up. We stood watching them go. There was no way we'd catch them now. Curse our luck, Bentham said. Even that small number of whites could wreak havoc for years to come. Agreed, brother. Though honestly, I didn't realize you gave a titmouse what happened to the rest of us. We turned to see Miss Peregrine walking towards us, returned to human form, a shawl clasped modestly around her shoulders. Her eyes were locked on Bentham, her expression sour and unwelcoming. Hello, Alma. Fantastic to see you he said with over-eager cheerfulness. And of course I give a... He cleared his throat awkwardly. Why, I'm the reason you're not still in a prison cell. Go on, children. Tell them. Mr. Bentham helped us a lot, I admitted, though I didn't really want to insert myself into a sibling spat. In that case, all due thanks, Miss Peregrine said coldly. I'll ensure the Council of Imbrins is made aware of the role you played here. Perhaps they'll see fit to lighten your sentence. Sentence? Emma said, looking sharply at Bentham. What sentence? His lip twisted. Banishment. You didn't think I'd live in this pit if I was welcome anywhere else, do you? I was framed, unjustly accused of collusion. 
Miss Peregrine said. Collaboration with the enemy. Betrayal after betrayal. I was acting as a double agent, Olma, mining our brother for information. I explained this to you. He was whining, his palms out like a beggar's. You know I have every reason to hate Jack. Miss Peregrine raised her hand to stop him. She'd heard the story before and didn't want to again. When he betrayed your grandfather, she said to me, that was the last straw. That was an accident, Bentham said, drawing back an offense. Then what became of the sword you drew from him? said Miss Peregrine. It was injected into the test subjects. Miss Peregrine shook her head. We reverse engineered your experiment. They were given soul from barnyard animals, which can only mean that you kept Abe's for yourself. What an absurd allegation, he cried. Is this what you told the council? That's why I'm still rotting in here, isn't it? I couldn't tell if he was genuinely surprised or just acting. I knew you felt threatened by my intellect and superior leadership capabilities, but that you'd stoop to such lies to keep me out of your way. Do you know how many years I've spent fighting to eradicate the scourge of ambrosia use? What on earth would I want with that poor man's soul? The same thing our brother wants with young Mr. Portman. Miss Peregrine said. I won't even honor that accusation with a denial. I only wish this haze of bias were clear so that you could see the truth. I'm on your side, Alma, and I've always been. You're on whatever side fits your interest at the moment. Bentham sighed and aimed a hangdog look at Emma and me. Goodbye, children. It's been a distinct pleasure knowing you. I'll go back home now. Saving all your lives has taken quite a toll on this old man's body. But I hope one day, when your headmistress comes to her senses, we'll meet again. He tipped his hat, and he and his bear began to walk away through the crowd, back through the compound toward the tower. What a drama queen, I muttered, though I did feel a little bad for him. Imbrint, Miss Peregrine called. Watch him. Did he really steal Abe's soul? Emma asked. Without proof, we can't be certain, replied Miss Peregrine. But the rest of his crimes taken together would earn him more than a lifetime's banishment. Watching him go, her hard expression gradually melted away. My brothers taught me a hard lesson. No one could hurt you as badly as the people you love. The wind shifted sending the ash cloud that had aided the Whites' escape in our direction. It came faster than we could react, the air around us howling and stinging, the daylight dimming away. There was a sharp flutter of wings as the embrans changed form and flew above the storm. My hollow sank to its knees, bowed its head, and shielded its face with its two free tongues. It was accustomed to ash storms, but our friends were not. I could hear them panicking in the dark. Stay where you are, I shouted. It'll pass. Everyone, breathe through your shirts, said Emma. When the storm began to subside a little, I heard something from across the bridge that made the hairs on my neck stand up. 
It was three baritone voices united in a song, the lines of which were punctuated by thuds and groans. Hark to the clinking of hammers. Hark to the driving of nails. Oh, my legs. What fun to build a gallows. Let me go. Let me go. The cure for all that ails. Please, no more. I give up. And then, as the ash began to clear, Sharon and his three burly cousins appeared, each of them dragging a subdued white. Morning, all, Sharon called. Did you lose something? Wiping ash from their eyes, our friends saw what they'd done and began to cheer. Sharon, you brilliant man, shouted Emma. All around us, the Embrens were landing and resuming human form. As they slipped quickly into the clothes they dropped, we respectfully kept our eyes on the whites. Suddenly, one of them broke away from his captor and ran. Rather than chasing him, the rigger calmly selected a small hammer from his tool belt, planted his feet, and threw it. It tumbled end over end straight toward the white's head, but what would have been a perfect takedown was spoiled when the white ducked. He darted toward the chaos of scrap at the road's edge. Just as the white was about to disappear between two shanty houses, a crack in the road erupted, and the white was engulfed in a belch of yellow flame. Though it was a grisly sight, everyone whooped and cheered. You see, said Sharon, the acre itself wants to be rid of them. That's wonderful, I said. But what about Call? I agree, said Emma. None of these victories will matter if we can't catch him. Right, Miss P? I glanced around but didn't see her. Emma looked, too, her eyes scanning the crowd. Miss Peregrine? She said, panic creeping into her voice. I made my hollow stand tall so I could get a better view. Does anyone see Miss Peregrine? I shouted. Now everyone was looking, checking the sky in case she was still airborne the ground in case she'd landed but not yet turned human. Then, from behind us, a high, gleeful shout cut through our chatter. Look no further, children. For a moment I couldn't pinpoint the voice. It came again. Do as I say, and no harm will come to her. Then I saw emerge from beneath the branches of a small, ashen-blackened tree just inside the White's Gate. A familiar figure. Call. A twig of a man with no weapons in his hand nor guards by his side. His face pale and contorted into an unnatural grin. His eyes capped by bulging sunglasses. Insectine. He was dandied up in a cloak, a cape, loops of gold jewelry, and a bouffant silk tie. He looked flamboyantly insane, like some mad doctor from gothic fiction who performed too many experiments on himself. And it was his evident madness, I think, and that we all knew him to be capable of true evil that stopped us from rushing to tear him apart. A man like Call was never as defenseless as he seemed. Where's Miss Peregrine? I shouted, inspiring a chorus of similar demands from the imprints and peculiars behind me. Right where she belongs, Call said. With her family. The last of the ash cloud gusted out of the compound behind him, revealing Bentham and Miss Peregrine. The latter in human form, held captive in the arms of Bentham's bear. Though her eyes flashed with rage, she knew better than to struggle against a sharp-clawed, short-tempered grim bear. 
It seemed a recurring nightmare we were doomed to dream again and again. Miss Peregrine kidnapped, this time by Bentham. He stood slightly behind the bear with eyes downcast, as if ashamed to meet our looks. Cries of shock and anger rippled through the peculiars and embrins. Bentham! I shouted. Let her go! You traitorous bastard! cried Emma. Bentham raised his head to look at us. As recently as ten minutes ago, he said in a high and imperious tone, you had my loyalty. I could have betrayed you to my brother days ago, but I didn't. He narrowed his eyes at Miss Peregrine. I chose you, Alma, because I believed, naively, it seems, that if I helped you and your wards, you might see how unfairly you judged me, might finally rise above past differences and let bygones be bygones. You'll be sent to the pitiless waste for this, Miss Peregrine shouted. I'm not frightened of your little council any more, Bentham said. You won't keep me down any longer. He stamped his cane. P.T. Muzzle. The bear clamped its paw over Miss Peregrine's face. Call strode toward his brother and sister, his arms and smile spreading. Benny's made a choice to stand up for himself, and I... For one, congratulate him. There's nothing like a family reunion. Suddenly, Bentham was pulled backward by an unseen force. A knife flashed at his throat. Make the bear release Miss Peregrine or else. A familiar voice shouted. Millard! Someone gasped, one of many that rippled through our crowd. It was Millard, disrobed and invisible. Bentham looked terrified, but Call seemed merely annoyed. He drew an antique pepper box pistol from one of the deep pockets in his cloak and pointed it at Bentham's head. Let her go and I'll kill you, brother. We made a pact, Bentham protested. And you caving to the demands of a nude boy with a dull knife would be breaking that pact. Call cocked the gun, walked it forward until it was pressed against Bentham's temple, and addressed Millard. If you make me kill my only brother, consider your Imbrin dead too. Millard hesitated for a moment, then dropped the knife and ran. Call made a grab for him but missed, and Millard's footsteps curved away in a trail of divots. Bentham composed himself and straightened his must shirt. Call, his good humor gone, turned the gun on Miss Peregrine. Now listen to me, he barked. You there, across the bridge, let those guards go. They had little choice but to do as he asked. Sharon and his cousins released their collared whites and backed away, and the white who'd been standing on our side of the bridge lowered his hands and picked his gun up off the ground. Within seconds, the balance of power had been reversed completely, and there were four guns aimed at the crowd and one at Miss Peregrine. Call could do what he wanted. Boy, he said, pointing at me. Pitch that hollow into the chasm. His shrill voice a needle in my eardrum. I walked my hollow to the edge of the chasm. Now make him leap. It seemed I didn't have a choice. It was an awful waste, but perhaps just as well. The hollow was suffering badly now, its wounds leaking black blood that flowed around its feet. It wouldn't have survived. I unwrapped its tongue from my waist, unsaddled myself, and stepped down. 
My strength had returned enough for me to stand on my own, but the hollows was going fast. As soon as I was off its back, it bellowed softly, sucked its tongues back into its mouth, and sank to its knees, a willing sacrifice. Thank you, whoever you were, I said. I'm sure that if you'd ever become a white, you wouldn't have been a completely evil one. I put my foot on its back and pushed. The hollow tumbled forward and dropped silently into the misty void. After a few seconds, I felt its consciousness disappear from my mind. The whites across the bridge rode over to our side on the hollow's tongues. Miss Peregrine's life threatened again if I interfered. Olive was yanked out of the sky. The guards set about herding us into a tight and easily controllable cluster. Then Call shouted for me, and one of the guards reached into the crowd and dragged me out. He's the only one we really need alive. Call said to his guards, If you must shoot him, shoot him in the knees, as for the rest of the... Call swung his gun toward the tightly packed crowd and fired. There were screams as the crowd surged. Shoot them any way you please. He laughed and twirled with his arms poised like a squat ballerina. I was about to run at him, ready to dig out his eyes with my bare hands and damn the consequences, when a long-barreled revolver appeared front and center in my field of view. Don't, grunted my monosyllabic guard, a white with broad shoulders and a shiny bald head. Call fired his own gun into the air and shouted for quiet, and every voice fell away but the whimpers of whomever he'd shot. Don't cry. I have a treat for you people, he said, addressing the crowd. This is a historic day. My brother and I are about to culminate a lifetime's worth of innovation and struggle by crowning ourselves the twin kings of peculiardom. And what would a coronation be without witnesses? So we're bringing you along, provided you behave yourselves. You'll see something no one has witnessed for a thousand years. The domination and expropriation of the Library of Souls. You have to promise one thing or I won't help you. I said to call. I didn't have much negotiating power, but he believed he needed me, and that was something. Once you get what you want, let Miss Peregrine go. I'm afraid that won't do, Call said. But I'll let her live. Peculiardom will be more fun to rule with my sister in it. Once I clip your wings, I'll keep you as my personal slave. Alma, how would you like that? She tried to respond but her words were lost beneath the bear's meaty paw. Call cupped a hand behind his ear and laughed. What's that? I can't hear you. Then he turned and began walking toward the tower. Let's go, the guard shouted, and soon we were all stumbling after him.